So I will tell you that um, in my background, I was an archaeologist and an anthropologist. And back in the um, 90s, I was using SPSS on a mainframe. And um, if, if I had been able to submit my project profile back then, I would have had the SPSS. And what a lot of people don't know is that SPSS means statistical processing for the social science. Is and and I was using it for demographic distributions as well as like you know looking for shards and sherds over you know geographic geographies. So one of the things that I have just been trained to think like is as a social scientist. And when we started to steer towards you know being able to differentiate what we do with um, data and the scientific method to solve our business problems, our clients' business problems is we started to think about, you know, how do we want to show up as a corporation? And thankfully, we have a very long history of really data responsibility where the the data, the data and the insights belong to our users, that belong to the the creators of that data. And, you know, with that, we have now established an AI ethics board and I am a representative of our um, trustworthy AI uh, center of excellence, where we have really enabled the humans to think a little bit differently. And so when we created, and, and I think that this was out of sheer necessity, that we needed to show people what what is the difference between a data science experiment and scaled AI. And when we set about to create this method, which is a formal method within IBM, we remixed um, CRISP-DM, which is the methodology that comes with SPSS that we inherited as IBM when we purchased SPSS. And it is it is with intention that we all chose crisp DM because it starts with the business problem and understanding that business problem. And when I was an archaeologist and an anthropologist before I would go um, listen to a story and, and do an ethnography, it was required for me to document how I was feeling, how I was thinking, what what my mood was. And that was something that I believe strongly that we bring to the table when we start to look at data and we start to scale out understanding how to look at data, we need to understand our own cognitive biases. So the mixture between social science and mathematics, between soft and hard, quantitative and qualitative, semantics and statistics, all of these things come together and with that, I'm going to let Router do the um, do 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 his interpretation of how we have now taken and created this scaled data science methodology, and we put it out there so that everyone can at least see and understand what are the 254 different work products and 53 different roles that you need in order to really perform a scaled data science um, project. So with that, Router. Let me get yeah. back for you. Sorry. No, <laughs> Got I, no, excited. I, <laughs> that's that's easy to see why. No, um, um, Mary, thanks, Beth. And uh, you know what? What I often have to do when when I I talk about uh, this presentation the, in this topic to people is almost let's say explain a bit why it says best practices because because sometimes that that leads people into thinking things that you know. Uh, we we don't intend. Um, so so in in the very beginning and and especially when we were working with with uh, junior data scientists that 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 came up. Often some or a lot of times the expectation was a bit like you know, I expect best practice to tell me like hey you know this type of situation this this type of model will, will work best. And you know that, and that is not you know, that is not the level of detail, or not the level of let's say determin deterministic uh, aspects that that a lot of the 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 industry applications of data science have. And and I'm reminded of this. And and Alex asked the 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 question in Q and A a bit before. You know. Sometimes, yes, we do publish research papers and, and what had happened a couple of years ago was that I was actually working on 
a joint research paper with an oil and gas uh, client about uh, predictive seismic modeling. Uh, and we were we were benchmarking several physical approaches with um, with uh, you know machine more machine learning driven approaches, and you know from from a, from a, a research team we were told that we were going to get reviewed by an expert, not a dual PhD but quadruple PhD. So that was that was a very tiny bit intimidating, and so we went into those day-long review sessions and we thought okay this this person is going to tell us oh you've done this wrong and this parameter this hyper parameter is wrongly tuned etc etc and what, what we came away with was really where he said you know the approach is solid the model selection strategy is solid you could try some bayesian modeling but i also don't know but like without trying it i don't know whether that will be better so 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 that is kind of the level of you know, uh, certainty on on approach that someone with years and years and years of, of, of studying experience was able to put on a very ill-defined problem. So so when when we talk about you know best practices for uh, our practitioners and our prof profession, um, let's say uh, population. We, we are talking much more about, okay, what are some of almost the, the, the philosophical things? What are the big picture items that we want you to get right, that we want you to be aware of? And, and then indeed, you know, yes, you want to do proper hyperparameter tuning. Yes, you want to have a solid model selection strategy, but that could, that's almost one, one level down. And, and that is something where, and this is this also, links back to that conversation I had with that L3 candidate. I said, well, you know, no one is here at this point to put your projects under a loop and saying like, oh, you should have used um, a random hyperparameter to, uh, tuning here versus a grid search. No one, no one here is to provide that level of scrutiny because we don't know yet what that matters. Um, you, we're here to see, are your choices properly motivated? And and do you understand the context in which you operate? So so uh, so that is you know the important caveat I, I I tend to give people when when I talk about data science best practices, and you know and the reason I I care about the same storyline that 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 Beth is is was expanding upon here is that we talked about her being an anthropologist and everything that comes with that. Uh, I'm a psychologist, uh, so that, that, that makes us quite a duo, uh, uh, you can imagine, in, in some of the IBM calls. But, uh, you know, that, that also means that for me, I, I haven't gone from psychology to neuroscience to, to, let's say, more general data science. What I also tend to care a lot about is the scientific method. And uh, I also spend quite a bit of time coding coding up hypotheses in SPSS, but I care a lot about how questions are formulated and what kind of the, the, the impact is we, we, we tend to have with that. And for me, data scientist is therefore a very, very um, general term. Um, I, I think we mentioned the Harvard Review uh, thing from a couple of years ago before, and I think in the wake of that, sometimes we've tended to, or some companies have tended to define data scientists as people that, you know, take data, put the algorithm on, put take the output. And for, but for me, it's much more than that. For me, it is, you know, taking the right type of decisions based on the information available. And and you know what whatever the tooling set there is that 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 is very open, and when you think about then you know the 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 scientific method and how we're doing this in in, in uh, data science is you know that aspect of it has sometimes been a bit let's say less um, less illuminated less less uh, reaffirmed. Uh, by the way, the, some of the some of the profession talks have, have been going, and what what we were thinking of doing is, uh, you know, how can we how can we help that? Because ultimately, when when we work with clients, but also when clients work internally, that is something that has impact. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen that, but sometime earlier this week, 
on archive, uh, a paper got published that, that was called How to Fool the Masses with Machine, or 10 Ways to Fool the Masses with Machine Learning. And it, it kind of used all these kind of, well, inadvertent tricks that, that people can uh, pull with numbers and with, with data science methodology and with machine learning to, you know, give the appearance of impact, but not the actual realization of impact. And this is, you know, this, this is a huge problem in a sense that um, all those companies that, that tried dipping their toes in the data science field five, six years ago, 50, 60% of them, uh, you know, two three, two, two, three years later were scratching their heads and going, it's weird, I have 30 people working on this, I have no impact. Or I have, uh, uh, you know, 60 people doing data processing, I have no models in production, or I don't know what these models are doing. And, and so, so what, what we, we got to see what the questions we were asked often as, uh, as consultants in the field was, you know, where is that gap coming from? Because I did all the things that, you know, the, the, the strategy agencies and everyone else were telling me to do. And so why, why did I end up with, let's say a mirage of value rather, rather than something that, that is changing the way I operate. And, um, and, and this is really where we started thinking of, okay, what do we need to change about also the way we tend to do things? And, and Beth was mentioned before, CRISPR-DM has long since been the standard of, um, uh, of data science methodology. Um, and it, you probably all know the phases where it has business and data understanding, there's, there's uh, some feature engineering, there's model building, there's deployment, and, and, and you know, that it is kind of the cycle to find uh, the answer to the question that, that people used to have, like, tell me something about my data that I didn't know yet and that is valuable. Um, and and the, the, the way that can have impact, or the way that, that knowledge would have impact was, was often undetermined. So, so uh, companies were not thinking through, well, once I know this, what does that mean? How will, how will that change things for me? Um, in, uh, in addition to it being a very difficult question, because when companies said, you know, here's my data, tell me something I didn't know yet, often data scientists were, were uh, in, a, in a very tricky position, because when, if a data scientist would come up with something, some, something that was weird in that data or that, that stood out to them, Companies would either say, "I knew that already. That is too, that is too generic. Uh, I, I've seen that. That's just the way my business works," or that is so far outside of how I thought I was would be operating. That can't be true. There must be something that that you did wrong. There must be something that is wrong with this data. What, whatever might might uh, be the be the excuse of the time. But it was very hard to calibrate. The, let's say that finding into something that was novel, both novel and accepted. Um, so we started thinking about, okay, what does what do we need to change in that life cycle to to go straight through uh, to to impact, so that we are no longer doing you know science on just the lab rats, but but that we have it that we have the uh, the the properly scaled version, uh, and that we use solution for impact. And, and we started thinking about, okay, what that means, it's not just data scientists. We, we, we talked at the end of the previous section about data access, about domain-driven design, about domain expertise, about uh, exposing you know, the standard data through a set of APIs so that, that the master data gets you know, properly followed up, et cetera. So, so here are all the things we started bringing together into that, that scale data science method. And yes, it has the aspects of CRISPR-DM and it has you know, proper da data engineering, it has proper ML engineering, but it also has things like DevSecOps and security by design because a data scientist will need to work with people before putting something in production where, where we can prevent you know, uh, data extraction, like uh, malevolent data extraction 
taking place or where, you know, um, high volume calls of the API can actually reveal uh, data that should be secure by design. Um, we uh, talked about test driven design um, because, uh, you know, we want to make sure that the systems we build hold up under all the circumstances that that the data will throw at them. Um, so so and and this is something that that is is all far too common because so I we've worked with companies that for example said you know uh, my model worked when I when I tried it in in my notebooks I I deployed it to production things don't seem to work that well uh, it turns out that for example all the the data that was coming from Japan from China from Russia with with where, where, where the 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 characters of the text were non-Western was getting filtered out. So so that that is something that was not tested for, that was not checked in production. And uh, you know, that, that obviously had impact on how that company was operating. Um it, it set, talked about enterprise design think for data and AI. So that goes in um so all of these these different disciplines is something that that we're putting together uh in into that scale data science method because uh, I think also from the beginning, when we came to this profession, we've always said data science is a team sport, and this is this is really what what how we try to formalize that because CRISPR-Cas9 by itself wasn't something that was acknowledging that fact that explicitly. If you go to the next slide, Beth. And and so so what what we what we've taken is really you know these these sections of CRISPR-Cas9 these 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 critical steps that we expect data scientists to be able to take business understanding data understanding data preparation etc cetera, etc cetera, and and embed them into let's say uh, into what we call let's say that garage innovation loop so so uh, the enterprise design thinking workshops are really our guidance for doing business understanding and data understanding with those ethical considerations with that with that human in the center that that set was talking about when when we are talking uh, data preparation and modeling that goes together with the people that know the master data around the you know the, the availability of of these apis that know what what needs to be changed that know what the lineage and provenance of this data has been uh, within the company, etc., and and you know when it comes to when it comes to then showing impact with with these models, uh, this this kind of workflow also takes into account okay an A/B test uh, how to to show impact if if that is successful, how would then a team operate such a model? How how would how would we make sure that a model gets refreshed from time to time? How do we make sure that a model is still valid when a law changes, when a business rule changes? And how, how do we make sure all those different steps of, um, of, of the business, of the, the, the world we build this model in, that they, that they act in concert? So, and, and I just, I wanna, you know, pause here for a second because, um, you know, we have these beautiful like loop-de-loops this represents over 254 different work products that we have examples for and 53 distinct roles. And, you know, front to back, it is an incredibly large effort to be able to get your data science team to be able to express their models as an API using code architecture so that the human being can get the right information at the right time to make the right types of decisions and this is how we build out, we call them intelligent workflows, but it is not a solved problem of what information, what human being needs at what time to take what information or to take what action. And, and I think that more than anything, we, we want people to understand that if you don't have your test retest reliability for your data science output, then you lose trust. And this goes back to what Seth was talking about earlier as well. You lose trust with your users and you cannot have impact with your data science, pro with your data science project. And that's something that I think that I want to steer people to is that it is the human being that we are augmenting with the right information 
And that takes an incredible amount of understanding of the business process and the domain expertise to tie it back to what we have. In addition, Radar, do you wanna talk just a couple minutes about um, what we have open sourced as far as our, our best practices? Yeah, uh, I, absolutely, Beth, because you know, I, I did talk a bit about these are all the things that, that go into that that full system design. We 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 had a challenge there internally for our data science population as well, because we also we also had so many practitioners that that grew up with Chris VM that said, you know, building models is my job. And we we had to think about how do we enable thousands of practitioners as well to to you know to know what they need to know about uh, source code, uh, to know what they need to know about data management and how that feeds into the, the models they build, to know what they need to know about ongoing quality measurements. So, so we developed an internal training, but but we also wrote down everything we taught in the training, and we open sourced that. So, so what what we did is about twenty one chapters from everything from you know what does a, a, a diverse project team look like to uh, you know use it to recommendations on scalability we have cloud deployment patterns in there to empower our data scientists and, and widening their their view really and uh, so 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 the link is there so like, like we said that's that's completely open sourced we we use that also to 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 drive some some publications uh for for, for example ieee um but this is how we build our internal community and and drove that that kind of next step and like Beth said this is not a solved issue this is also why we open source it so that there's iteration and there's community around this um but but this is the approach we took in terms of saying let's just let's just put it out there and uh, and continuously work on this over the next few years And then part of, you know, part of what we were thinking too is like, we wanted to make sure to, to show people where to start um, and where to start is always with our data and an AI and it's understanding the problem that we need to solve. And I have got to tell you that working with our designers on creating this, this very comprehensive set of of workshops, of work products, of procedures to get at the intent. It has been such a phenomenal discovery because a lot of where people want to use AI or where they want to apply data science, most of it typically comes down to understanding what is the business need and how do you get that right information to the right time to the right person and and so that that person can take the right action, hopefully for growing the business. So with that, I definitely wanted to stop sharing and see if we can field any questions or if there's any um, comments. I don't see any questions in the uh, panel. I, I am curious if you can talk a little bit more about the decision to open source the uh, the data science best practices. I mean, that seems like a really great thing for uh, for the industry and for practitioners and just sort of what went into that decision. Um, so we, uh, with our acquisition of Red Hat, you know, a lot of our company is shifting culture and we're shifting from, you know, proprietary um, products to more open source. And I, I think that we can see this shift within the industry. I briefly mentioned this um, before, there's always trade-offs um, when you, you know, I think that the log4j um, issue that just happened to all of us is a great example. But I, I will say that when you have the widest, the <laughs> wider your variance, the more standard your mean, um, you know, you, you look at the amount of things that can be that can be constructed when you make space and put it out there and you want people to contribute. I am always surprised and I love being surprised and delighted by the, the next generation's version of, of what, what we are doing. And how does the next generation take, you know, some of the principles of the past and remix it and make it relevant for today. So I think that that is something that 
you know, we believe in strongly and it's part of our ethos and atmosphere and our ethics to be able to share our expertise with others. I don't know any other company that could have really put together, you know, our data science methodology and some of our best practices because we have that that variance and we have that breadth and the depth. So we want everyone to contribute. We don't think that we've solved it and we don't think that we can solve it alone. We need our we need everyone to help. And we've tried to make as much space as possible. And I think that um, one of the things that you know, I am personally learning always is to welcome feedback. Uh, um, if if I can 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 add to to that best, because so I I think from let's say our culture and direction that that's com completely accurate and, and complete. But the other thing that that's you know I I think is a bit of a factor, or at least was to me was, um, time in in the sense that um, a lot of the the data scientists i would say they're they're growing up almost uh, to 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 use that term perhaps a bit wrongly but you know uh, the 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 open source culture is a lot more ingrained in into into the group that is now uh you know mid mid level managers get, that's getting to senior positions etc than it was you know 10 20 years ago uh, but I think Beth and I both talked about how we still did a lot of things, um, you know, in SPSS and that we, we coded our analyses that way. A couple of years after I stopped doing that, the, 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 uh, most of the faculty was using R as, 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 as open source software. So, you know, it's also an acknowledgement of the fact that, that a lot of this, uh, a big chunk of this population We'll, we'll put a lot of trust in open source and the open source community and has that as their homes. And, you know, it is also, so it's also a reflection of us seeing that, that, you know, the makeup of this profession change over time uh, and, and uh, you know, wanting to be a part of that. Okay. Um, so a couple of other questions have come in, uh, one from, uh, my colleague and your former colleague, Andra Sakal, uh, uh, in this day and age, how do we ensure data transparency and avoid bias? I have seen researchers look for the right statistical analysis that supports their original thesis, but this may not actually support ground truth. How is IBM working to avoid this in data science and AI? I think you have to train the human, as I alluded to earlier. Um, you know, the, the some of the work that we get to do again through our academy. Um, recently, we just did one on using the Titanic data set and using that to understand um, survivability. And people in steerage would never have gotten on a on a boat because of their socioeconomic class. And we think in terms of biases, but, you know, there's statistical bias and there's skew and there's, there's lots of things mathematically. But when we are talking about AI that impacts human beings, we need to talk about cognitive biases and we need to talk about our own understanding of having a diverse amount of people thinking through the problem because it is it is always the underrepresented and the 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 person that is not on the data science team that is typically the one going hey how come alexa doesn't hear my voice and every single time we think through that we have enough of a variance we need to start thinking differently about looking at algorithms and looking at who who they are benefiting, the output, is the output benefiting a certain amount of people over another person? Um, and, and I think that that's a really good way to start to think through some of these things. It, it is a very complex, hard problem to solve. And I, I think that we, we really are just at the beginning. I, I will add that's that's another reason that I want so many more people to I want to democratize how many people are understanding that algorithms are only probably correct some of the time. And that probabilistic thinking is something that we need to engender in, in this next generation, if not ourselves. 
Okay, and so one final question, where can people find information about the, data, the IBM Data Science Apprenticeships? That is a great question. Um, I'm positive it's it's probably on our IBM.com website somewhere. <laughs> um, and we do have an excellent apprenticeship program. And you know, part of the work we do and I get to do is with our P-TECH students, which are, is our Pathways to Technology, where we take students who are first generation of high school graduates and we have um, and they the P Tech when you graduate from high school you graduate with a two year associate's degree, and we are making them part of our apprenticeship program and part of our IBM culture. Again, looking for that variance of thought, so that we're we're looking for people who you know come from a very different socioeconomic condition than some of the the PhDs that work in our research team, for instance. 